that can become a thing of the past. I believe that God is writing a new chapter in your life, one that will be marked by diminishing anxiety and increasing peace, that he has provided for us a prescription for anxiety. And this prescription is found in some paragraphs in a book called Philippians. The words are going to appear in the screen. I invite you to say them out loud with me. Let's read them together. Sit up straight. Fill your lungs with air and say it like you mean it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness <laughs> be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. And the peace of God. Mm. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I'm so grateful you're here as we continue the study of this passage. And if you're in the overflow rooms, we're grateful that you're here too, and we're going to make more room for you. We're so grateful to have this passage to help us understand how God deals with anxiety and helps us do the same. So let's pray together, and then we'll get to work. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for all you've done and all you do. We pray you'd forgive the sins of our speaker. They are many. And help us to see Christ, just Christ. Through Christ, we pray. And all the church said, The hangover was terrible, but I could handle that. The nausea was palpable, but I knew it would pass. The discipline was severe, but I knew I deserved it. What I couldn't handle was the guilt. You've heard parts of my story. Our family tree has suffered from a blight of alcoholism. Consequently, my father made it very clear to my brother and me that there would be no drunkenness permitted in his house. To reinforce his point, he would take my brother and me when we were young, eight, nine, ten years of age, to rehab centers to visit his sister, his brothers, who had lost their jobs, who had lost their marriages, who had lost their lives as a result of alcohol abuse. And we would promise him, oh, Dad, we'll never do that. Then why did I? Why did I, at the age of 16, buddy up with another 16-year-old and get so ragingly inebriated that we could not walk? And why did we in our state drive cars and cause trouble and endanger the lives of others? Why did we drink so much Coors that our heads were spinning and our stomachs were turning? Why did we get so commode-hugging drunk that we could not stand up? Did I really think my father wouldn't hear me? Did I really think he would believe me when I blamed it on Mexican food? <laughs> Did I have any idea? And when I awoke the next morning, my head was pounding, my stomach was upset. But what I felt more than anything, and more than any time I had ever felt it, was a sense of guilt. I had felt guilt before, but never a guilt like this. There is a guilt that sits in the soul like a concrete block. 
There is a guilt that causes a person not to feel bad just for doing something bad, but there is a guilt that causes a person to feel bad for being alive. There is a guilt that causes a person to look at the person in the mirror and say, who are you? Who is this liar, this deceitful hypocrite? Who is this person? Where did you come from? There is a guilt that descends quickly into shame. Guilt says, I did bad. Shame says, I am bad. And that day, that weekend, I was dealing with this guilt. I'm not sure that's the worst thing I've ever done in my life, but I will say that's the first time I ever felt that destructive guilt, and I did not know what to do with it. I didn't know where to place it. Maybe there's somebody on the planet who has never felt that guilt, but I haven't met them. And I have a hunch they're not in this room. Your guilt may have been as a result of alcohol, or maybe it was a result of inappropriate sex, or embezzlement, or dishonesty, or losing your temper, or losing your control, or breaking your promise. And maybe your guilt is not the consequence of a moment in life, but maybe more a season of life. You feel like a failure as a parent. You feel like you've squandered your career, wasted your youth. Maybe you inherited guilt. Maybe your parent or parents abused you, passing on to you a sense of, will you deserve this? This ugly thing called guilt. I would suggest to you that this guilt is one of the seeds out of which grows the weed of anxiety. Please write this down in your outline. Guilt creates anxiety. The emotion of guilt creates anxiety. This may be a new thought for you. Pick up most books on anxiety and you read discussions about overcrowded calendars and dealing with hard and harsh demands or expectations, and all of those can bear anxiety as well. Less discussed but equally important is the idea of guilt, shame, anxiety. In fact, I would suggest to you that the very first documented case of anxiety in the history of the world can be traced back to unresolved guilt. You remember the story or the moment from the Garden of Eden? That evening, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, and they hid themselves among the trees. That's what anxious people do. They ran, and they hid. What has happened to the first family? This is their first appearance of anything but tranquility in the Garden of Eden. Up until now, it's just been peace. It's just been contentment. No fear, no trepidation. In fact, the Scripture says they did not hide from God because they had nothing to hide. At chapter 2 and verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There was no shame, no guilt, no shame in the Garden of Eden. But then what happened? Then came the serpent. Then came the forbidden fruit. They said yes to temptation. They said no to God. And in a moment, in a moment, everything changed. They covered themselves with leaves and they hid from God. They did what anxious people do. They scurried They entered into a frenzy of cover-ups and hideouts. Guilt came first. Anxiety came next. Guilt came. 
Anxiety followed. Guilt drove the truck. Anxiety rode in the back. And they set out on this effort to cover themselves or hide from God. We're still doing the same. We're trying to figure out what in the world will we do with this guilt. Make a list of how we deal with guilt. It's pretty exotic. I have a list of ten ways that we deal with guilt. Number one, we deny it. We pretend that we never did anything bad. We concoct a plan to cover up the bad choice, and one lie leads to another lie. We adjust the second lie to move to the third lie. Before long, our first thought to any question is, what did I say last? Or we minimize it. We didn't sin. We just lost our way. We didn't sin. We just caught up in the moment. We didn't sin. We just do what everybody does. We didn't sin. We just took the wrong path. We just experienced a lapse in judgment. We minimize it. Or we denounce the very existence of it. There is no sin because there is no standard. There is no ultimate truth. And there is no ultimate truth or standard because really there is no God. There is no sin because there is no truth. There is no right and wrong unless you offend me. And then I think that's wrong. Or we bury it, suppress the guilt beneath a mound of work and a calendar of appointments. The busier we stay, the less time we have to spend with the person we have come to dislike ourselves. Or we punish it, beat ourselves up, cut ourselves, hurt ourselves. Priests used to flog themselves with whips. We've exchanged whips for rules more prayer, more Bible study, more church attendance, more giving, stay up later, get up earlier. We pay for our guilt, painful penance. Or we numb it with a bottle of gray goose, with an hour of pornography, with a joint of marijuana, with a rendezvous at a hotel. Guilt disappears during happy hour, right? Funny how it reappears when happy hour ends. We avoid the mention of it. Certain topics are just off limits. We don't talk about certain things. Just live life on the surface and pray that the Loch Ness monster of guilt never wakes up. We redirect it. Just take it out on everybody. Lash out at the kids. Take it out on the wife. Yell at the employees or the driver in the next lane. We begin to so hate ourselves that we don't let someone love us for fear they will find out who we really are and then hate us. We offset it. We resolve to never make another mistake. We'll just be perfect from now on. Pursue perfection, the perfect family, the perfect career. Score the perfect grades. Be the perfect Christian. Everything must be perfect. Hair car, tone of voice, ever in control, absolutely no foul-ups. Or we embody it. We didn't screw up. We are a screw up. We didn't mess up. We're a walking mess up. We didn't get drunk. We are a drunk. We are destined to be bad and in some weird way, we start taking joy in being bad. We're bad to the bone. I'm just made to be bad. I'm just bad. It's weird. <laughs> Adam and Eve hid behind fig leaves. We still hide, don't we? So let's go back to that story of 16-year-old Max. What's he going to do, this kid who wakes up <clears throat> not just with a hangover but with the guilt? What's he going to do with it? Well, suppose he takes one or any combination of these ten options. Suppose he denies it, suppresses it, numbs it, offsets it. Suppose he kind of makes a route through all of them depending on what day of the week it is. What's he going to be like in ten years? What's it going to be like in 20 years? What's it going to be like in 40 years? What kind of person does off what kind of person does unresolved guilt create? 
think it creates an anxious one, a troubled one, one who is always doing what Adam and Eve did, running and hiding, running and hiding. As one man said, I was always living a lie for fear someone might see me for who I really was and then think less of me, disapprove of me, reject or judge me. So I hid behind my fig leaf of competence or knowledge or super spirituality or a whole list of other options. And living this lie was exhausting and anxiety producing. Doesn't it make sense that if guilt causes anxiety, that to deal with anxiety we must go upstream, upriver, and deal with guilt? And that this peace that passes understanding happens once we discover this grace that is greater than our sin. This was the opinion of the Apostle Paul. Last week I mentioned to you that really the Apostle Paul built all of his teachings around two truths. Test me on this. Every epistle, every sermon of the Apostle Paul seems to come back to one of two pillars of faith. This was his belief system. Belief creates behavior. If you want to change a person, you deal with belief. His belief system had two pillars in it. One was the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign over circumstance. And the second is the one we're looking at today, and that is the grace of God. That God's grace is greater than our sin, and this grace erases guilt. Now, you know the story of Paul. No one had more reason to feel guilt than the Apostle Paul, right? He was an ancient version of ISIS. He had blood on his hands. He set out not just to hurt Christians, but to destroy the whole Christian movement. The Bible says this about the Apostle Paul. Paul was like a wild man going everywhere to devastate the believers, even entering private homes and dragging out men and women alike and jailing them. He was a persecutor. In addition, he was a legalist. That is to say, he thought salvation was a legal transaction. He does this, God has to do that. So he elaborated this concoction of self-salvation. He articulated this concoction of self-salvation in the book of Philippians. Have you read it? It's in Philippians chapter 3. He says, if anyone had reason to hope that he could save himself, it would be I. If others could be saved by what they are, certainly I could. <laughs> For I went through the Jewish initiation ceremony when I was eight days old, having been born into a pure-blooded Jewish home that was a branch of the old original Benjamin family. I was a real Jew if ever there was one. What's more, I was a member of the Pharisees who demands strictest obedience to every Jewish law and custom. Sincere? <laughs> yes. So much that I greatly persecuted the church. I tried to obey every Jewish rule and regulation right down to the last point. So Paul had blood on his hands. He had religious diplomas on his wall. But then came that Damascus Road moment. When Jesus came to Paul, and once Paul saw Jesus, Paul couldn't see anymore. He couldn't see any more merit in his merits. He couldn't see any more worth in his accomplishments. He couldn't see any reason to brag about what he had done. He couldn't see any reason to do anything except cast himself upon the grace of Christ. And he couldn't see any other course for the rest of his life except to spend the rest of his life talking more about Christ and less about self. And he became the great poet of grace. This grace changed his life. As he said in the book of Philippians, all these things that I once thought very worthwhile, I've now thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and hope where? 
in Christ alone. In exchange for that rubbish of self-salvation, God gave him righteousness. Now, Paul wrote, I am right with God, not because I followed the law, but because I believed in Christ. Paul found joy because he found grace, a great, unlimited, life-changing, unconditional grace. Paul gave his guilt to Christ. He didn't hide it. He didn't suppress it. He, didn't, he quit trying to offset it. He didn't numb it. He didn't punish it. He simply surrendered it to Jesus Christ. As a result, he could write, again, still in Philippians, I am still not all I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing. Look at this. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us up to heaven because of what Christ Jesus did for so what would Paul say to a guilt-laden teenager? I believe he would say, give your guilt to Christ. Cast yourself entirely upon his mercy. Trust in his ability to forgive. Because unresolved guilt will turn you into a miserable, weary, angry, stressed out, fretful soul. Church, guilt sucks the life out of our souls. It sucks the life out of our souls. But grace, grace restores the joy, restores the joy in our innermost being. That's why we can say grace calms the anxious soul. Grace is the word the Bible uses to describe the undeserved favor of God. He knows we cannot live with our guilt. So he took our guilt and he put it on his son. And when Jesus died on the cross, he received upon him our punishment for our sins. Consequently, our sins, though they be severe, are adequately paid for in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he does what only he can do. And when Paul discovered this, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He told Titus, God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation's available for everyone. Now look at this. Tell them all this and build up their what? Anxiety is a result of guilt, but courage is a result of grace. Grace creates confidence. A perfect love is discovered that casts out all what? Fear. And there's a sense of confidence that comes to the saint. The happy saint is one who is at once aware of the severity of sin, yet the immensity of grace. He does not compromise and pretend that he has never sinned, but nor does he denounce for one second God's ability to forgive those sins. This is the happy, peace-filled, tranquil saint. And I can bear witness to this, church. I could take you to the city. I could take you to the church. I could take you to the auditorium. I could take you to the section of chairs in that auditorium. I think I could even find the very chair in which I was sitting when, as a 20-year-old, I heard someone do for me what I'm attempting to do for you, and that is explain this wonder of God's grace. I had spent three and a half years just spiraling through that list of inappropriate Attempts to cope with that guilt. Numbing it one weekend, suppressing it the next, denying it, offsetting it. I was just a mess. And I was headed toward a lifetime of misery. And when that preacher, Lynn Anderson, began talking about this grace that is greater than sin, and when he at the end of the message said, does anybody want this grace? You couldn't have held me down with chains 
truth of the matter is I had been held down with chains and I was finally set free I've had anxiety in my life that's been 40 years I've had anxiety but I will say I have never ever had an anxious moment due to a fear of no salvation ever maybe I'm just such a sinner that I don't have another alternative but I have had to throw myself entirely upon the grace of Jesus Christ. I do not believe I have ever been saved more or less than I was when I was first saved. I do not believe that any bad deed has deducted from my salvation. I do not believe that any good deed, if there are any, has contributed to my salvation because my salvation has nothing to do with me and everything to do with Christ. Because when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he meant it. And it was absolute and it was complete. And it was the greatest discovery in the history of the world. That what separates the Christian faith from any other philosophy, dogma, or religion is that we believe that God saves sinners. Religion says God saves saints. And you've got to become a saint before you can be saved. I was not a saint, but I believe I'm saved because of the grace of Jesus Christ. This grace my friend, will set you free from some anxiety that maybe, maybe you've always wondered why you're a troubled soul, why you have these sudden outbursts of anger, why you can't really be at peace. When down deep you wonder, have I done enough? And if I've done enough, have I really done enough? Maybe somebody all your life has told you that salvation is up to you. Then my job today is to stand in bold defiance to that lie and tell you that salvation is the work of a Savior. That's why we call him a Savior. And redemption is not the work of the redeemed. It's the work of the Redeemer. That's why we call him the Redeemer. And you don't need rules and regulations. You need a Messiah. You need someone to save you. Henry Nouwen great Catholic theologian spent part of his early life traveling of all things with a circus and during those years he came to be friends with the acrobats the people who manned the trapeze artists and he asked one of them once what's the secret of flying from trapeze to trapeze up in the middle of the circus tent and the acrobat gave him this response. He said, the secret is that the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. When I fly, I simply have to stretch out my arms and wait for the catcher to catch me and pull me safely over the apron. The worst thing the flyer can do is to try to catch the catcher. I'm not supposed to catch the catcher. It's the catcher's job to catch me. If I catch him, I might break his wrists or he might break mine. And that would be the end for both of us. A flyer must fly, a catcher must catch, and the flyer must trust. With outstretched arms, that his catcher will be there for him. In the great trapeze act of salvation, we are the flyer and God is the catcher. And we throw ourselves upon him, not because of any good that we have done, but because we believe he is good and he alone. Dear friend, it is time for you to put the past in the past. Maybe your anxiety has been dogging you all these years, and today God is telling you why. Would you please, once and for all, receive absolute forgiveness for those mistakes? Just receive it. Just receive it. Just let His grace go deeper than it's ever gone before. What you did wasn't good. I'm not saying it was. But what I am saying is that you serve a good God. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died for every single sin. 
and it's time for you to put it in the past. There's a reason that the windshield is larger than the rearview mirror. And that is because what lies ahead is much more important than what lies behind. You are not who you were. You are not what you did. You are a child of God. Receive the grace of Christ. And if you do, and when you do, you will discover that you really can be anxious.